It's time for the Wrestling Perspective Podcast. That man right there getting up, blowing a kiss to who I hope is his girlfriend. That's your girlfriend? Yeah, that's my girlfriend. We'll no, but I, it was a, it's a real kiss, Dennis. It's none of this fake wrestling kisses. Oh. <laughs> did you give her the wrestler handshake before she left? No, no she no just put... She, she jumped up and did like a high cross body on me. Uh, caught her, kissed her, put her back down. Well, he is the excellence of execution. He is the best there is, the best there was, the best there ever will be, then, now, and forever, copyright WWE. That's Lars <laughs> Fredrickson. Please refer to me as Lars. Thank Lars, you. Lars. Lars. <laughs> <laughs> the man from upstairs said, uh, you're no longer allowed to be called Lars. Uh, it's <laughs> Lars. <laughs> Lars. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> We have a very special guest, a guy who I am a big fan of. He is the last real man. That's mm-hmm. Silas Young. That's right. Oh, bud, thank you. Thanks, Silas. Well, yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. So I, I'm going to lead off the questioning here and say you've been in a couple other organizations in the past, but you are so closely tied to Ring of Honor. When I think of you, I think of Ring of Honor. And, and now that Ring of Honor has gone through this change, which we'll probably deep dive in a little bit later, because I think you're the first Ring of Honor guy we're had on since the announcement. Do you do you feel it like you've lost a bit of your identity now that you're no longer closely tied to Ring of Honor? Uh, you know what? Uh, weirdly, uh, uh, you know, it, it always sucks to lose a job, especially a job that's given you like a, a guaranteed paycheck or whatever. But uh Weirdly, it's been a good thing for me. You know, we've had these these last two years that were just uh, sitting at home all the time and bar- barely working. And for me, I'm, a, I'm the type of person I need I need some stuff to be motivated. So uh, w- weirdly, I feel like it's I feel like it's been a good thing. But there is still that part that, you know, I was so closely associated with Ring of Honor being there for nine years. So it's. It feels like there's definitely a, a part lost, but at the same time, it feels like a good thing. It was something I needed for myself personally. Well, do you think that, you know, as a result of this hiatus, uh, it, it, you know, it, have you found more job opportunities out there, meaning like on the indies and in other companies? I mean, do you see yourself like your, your horizon broadening as far as the way that you're looking at the business? Uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Uh, you know, um, you know, I'm booked every weekend to do shows for the next few months. Uh, and, you know, as time goes by, more things come in. Uh, I mean, I, I feel like it's a good thing. Like I said, I needed this. Like I'm the type of person that I'm kind of have to be like a all in. And when I, I had this this last couple of years, like I said, I'm just sitting at home. It, it it killed me. You know, I haven't had any any feelers from any big companies like AEW or WWE or anything like that. But, you know, I really looked at this when when this was all announced and we found out about this as an opportunity to get back out there and start working hard again and to be able to do the independence, you know, it'd been about five or six years since I've been able to do any independent shows. So now getting this opportunity again, I'm trying to look, I'm trying to look for like the silver lining in it, you know, trying to find the, uh, the good, uh, you know, I'm, I'm like excited about wrestling again. You know, you, you work for a place for so long and that has, you know, nothing but awesome talent there, which is always great to work with awesome talent, but, you know, after nine years, you kind of, you kind of look forward to be able to get out and work with, uh, with new people. So there's definitely been a lot of, um, a lot of people reaching out, you know, like I said, I got bookings every weekend. So that's a good thing that, uh, you know, there's interest in that, you know, I'm, I'm getting the opportunity to get out there and work with these other people. I think it's, I'm really looking at it like 2022 is just my year to like go out there, really work hard on the independence and try and kind of you know, rebuild my name again. You know, I felt like for myself, uh, you know, I was never like a guy that was like a, a hot independent name that everybody wanted to bring in. I felt like I just, you know, I kind of got my position because of, you know, good timing, like anything in life comes down to good timing, but also just, uh, you know, being pretty fucking good at what I do, you know? So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to all that this next year has to bring and any opportunities it brings my way nine years is there that first day of school feeling right now for you when you think about going on some of these indie bookings because you you haven't had to do that now you're going in and essentially starting over because like you said i i don't remember you taking any indie bookings as long as i've been a fan of yours really and if you did it was a very very sparse you know here and there kind of thing 
So, I mean, is, is this kind of new? Like, do you, do you feel like a rookie? Uh, you know, weirdly a little bit, uh, you know, uh, in wrestling five or six years can be a lifetime. You know, you go when you're young and you're starting out in wrestling, you kind of start doing like the little shows around your area and you kind of know everybody. Uh, and now even, uh, you know, coming back and doing these shows after that many years, I go to these shows and I barely know anybody that's in the locker room, you know, I'll maybe know one or two people. And even if it is one or two people that I know, it's not like I, I know them, know them very well. So it's definitely, uh, I don't feel like I need to prove myself so much. If, if anything, I feel like I'm trying to prove myself to myself uh, that, you know, I'm still capable, you know, I'm 41 years old, so I'm not exactly young for wrestling, but I'm also not old. My body feels great. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely like a weird feeling uh, coming into places where, you know, you see a lot of these guys have been working together and, you know, done a lot of shows for a long time. So it's kind of like um, rebuilding some camaraderie amongst people. Well, you know, you got, you got so many, you know, companies that are working that have TV that have the ability to kind of get the product out into the world, whether it be the NWA, GCW, AEW, Impact. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on. You know, I mean, what are, are there any specific companies besides, let's say, the other big two, uh, Impact and AEW? Is there any other kind of companies that maybe you 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 thought, well, wow, I'd like to go and and, and work there? You know, whether it be a GCW or you know any place really. Yeah, I mean, you you mentioned at the NWA, like I love the way their uh, their product looks. It looks so old school. It reminds me of wrestling uh, when I was a kid. So the NWA is definitely something uh, you know that I'd definitely be interested in. I just know it's so hard right now. With you know, you get a whole roster of people that are released. It's it's so much available talent out there, and just in in general, the indie scene is so is so flooded. Uh, with with new guys and girls uh, working, you know, there's so many schools out there that are putting out a whole crop of uh, new trainees or new wrestlers every few months. Um, so, you know, that's it's a, I think it's a little bit more difficult to get into some of those places. But, you know, you, you mentioned the, the two that, you know, I uh, would definitely be interested in, in GCW and NWA. And, uh, you know, they're two very different uh, types of fields, but I feel like uh, you know, the character and what I do, I feel like it could really uh, work both places. So I, I would definitely like to try work, try working for the NWA though, for sure. You, you absolutely have an NWA look in. Yeah, for sure. From in next week, we'll have Josh Woods on the podcast. And I, one of my questions for him is, I guess something I'll ask you is I've noticed in his rivalry when you two were wrestling each other, uh, somewhere along the way, the flip switched in him and he is, his game stepped up and you could almost noticeably see it on TV. Not that he was bad. That's not what I'm saying because I'm a fan of his, but he went from great to, to phenomenal. Did When you're wrestling someone in, in, I'm sure that's not the first time that's happened with you when, when you're in the middle of a, a program with someone and, and somewhere the switch flips and the story goes from good to amazing. The, the in-ring goes from great to phenomenal. How, how does that happen? Do you notice it as someone that's in the moment there with him? Yeah, absolutely. And you know what? I think, I think in Josh's case, uh, you know, I, I don't know if you're familiar, like Josh was like a, like a multiple time, uh, like division one wrestling champion. He was a guy that like his whole life, you know, uh, was wrestling, uh, wrestling based, you know, and, uh, for, for a lot of people that come from that background, sometimes it can be hard to make that switch from, I guess, from real wrestling to pro wrestling because they're, they're such different things, you know, in, in the, uh, you know, I guess the collegiate style wrestling, you're taught to like, maybe not show so much emotion or to, you know, let yourself get, uh, you know, caught up in things where it's pro wrestling. That's exactly what you want to do. You want to show that emotion, uh, so to see that, see that change with Josh, uh, it was, it was pretty awesome because it compared to other people in wrestling, not even just, uh, wrestler wrestlers that come in and do it, but just people in general, usually the, the learning curve is a little bit slower, but for him, it just, it was like a light, a light switch got flipped on, you know, um, when he had first started with ring of honor, he, they kind of didn't know what they were doing with them. He was used, but they kind of just used them, you know, here and there, but never really with any, definite plans and then uh, when him and I started doing the thing together uh it was like every show that we did together he got better and better so it was all it was it was a really cool thing to be be part of that and, and see that change in him but yeah I mean that's uh I, I think that's more the rarity than the norm uh 
that happened with Josh. I think in this, in this business, like what I've noticed, I mean, you were with the company for basically nine years, which says a lot about you in, in, in so many ways, because over those nine years, there were so many guys who came and went out of that company, but you were, were there, you were a pillar. So my, my, my question to you is, is that you, did you ever kind of see, you know, you saw these guys coming in and out of here, but you were always the stalwart. Do you, did you ever find yourself in a place of like seeing yourself as a leader in that company? Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, I think it, it got to a point where, you know, as there was more talent coming in, you know, like you said, I had been there for a long time. I definitely had, uh, you know, guys who were, you know, would reach out to me or ask my opinions on things or, or come to me for advice. So it was definitely, uh, you know, definitely was a thing where I started to feel like, uh, a little bit of a, a leader, I guess. I know for myself personally, I'm usually a little bit more of a quiet, laid back dude. So I'm, I'm not like one of those people that feels like they need to be the center of attention all the time, uh, which I think kind of kind of goes along with the leadership role usually is typ typically when people have that leadership role, they are typically people who are a little bit more the the center of attention or, or the, the voice in the room, so to speak. But, you know, I think... Uh, I think at the same time, uh, you know, I'd built, I'd built a reputation of, of being good at what I do and people respected that. Well, listen, they, ne they say never say never. And this might be one of those internet gotcha headline questions. So bear with me on it. Do you see yourself when they bring the product back going back? Or do you think your time there is done and it's time to move on? Because nobody really knows, maybe you guys do, what the new uh, look of Ring of Honor is going to look like. They say they just want to mainly use indie guys. Nobody really knows. But in your mind, are you like, you know what, that was fun. I'm moving on or never say never? Uh, you know what? I mean, I, I really haven't made up my mind to be quite honest with you. I don't I feel like no one really knows exactly what's going on there, or at the very least, I don't know what's going on there. Uh, it, it was, it was interesting though, that uh, the, on the same call that we all got told we were being released from our contracts, that they also told us they were running a show <laughs> come April, which is uh, kind of a bit of a fucking slap in the face, to be quite honest with you. Uh, basically my takeaway from all of it was, is that, uh, guys were getting paid a lot of money to not work very often. I mean, and this was even pre pandemic. I mean, pre pandemic, we were doing what maybe 40, 50 shows a year, which in the grand scheme of things really ain't a whole lot, you know? Uh, so I, I feel like the whole thing was more of a, a budget cut thing than anything else uh, as far as what they're going to do in the future. And if I'd be involved, I mean, I'm always open. I'm always open to be involved. Uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's wrestling, it's entertainment. You, you always have to like, you know, try and put yourself in the best positions possible. Uh, and I, I mean, as much as I enjoy working the independence, I would, I would definitely be open to going back and working there, but uh, you know, ideally, you know, some other opportunities would come up first. You know, one of the things that, you know, we've been getting a lot of people who's, you know, since the forbidden door has been knocked down, is that what they call it? Yeah. The forbidden you, door. In the school once and, by Tony. That's right. Tony Khan schooled me. <laughs> but anyways no i love tony but anyway my point is is that like because there's so much cross-pollination and so many guys like you know matt cardona is doing death matches and there's it seems like the um how would i say it the menu is is so much more it's bigger right like you can go yeah. and do different stuff with different people is right. there a match or is there a style that you just like i'm not doing that uh, I mean, and I won't say that I won't ever do it, but uh, I mean, I've been asked about doing a few death matches. Uh, it's, it's just not my thing. Um, I, well, why? <laughs> Tell me why. Uh, I mean, ah, fuck. I mean, I guess like it's, it's just not my thing. I don't feel like it's my forte. Uh, like no, I like don't wrestling. give me the I, stock I, answers, bro. All Tell right. me why. Like what's feel, what's in here? What's in here? <laughs> I mean, I just, I just don't want to do it. Like, I don't, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not like a big, I'm not a big fan of the style. Like, I don't, I don't mind watching it. I, I respect the guys that do it and all that. This is just not my thing. And honestly, I feel like, uh, I feel like I've been doing this wrestling thing for so long and I've, I've built my name, my character, my style off of one thing. And, and honestly, I figure if I'm ever going to do death matches, I'd rather wait until my career is slowed down and I'm maybe not getting as many bookings and then come back and do, do death matches where it would be something new and fresh. 
So I'd so rather I'd rather so save it for right. a time that I need to do it than just doing it because someone wants me to book me to do it. I don't feel like I I don't feel like I'm a point in my career where I need to do that. Uh, and it's just not my thing. Well, so my, I guess, you know, besides the death matches, is there anything else that you wouldn't do, you know, do, or is it, is it like, you're open to all prospects, but you know, yeah, no, I'm, I'm a whore for wrestling, man. <laughs> uh, I just, I just, I want to be like, honestly, like, I know a lot of guys in wrestling are like, Oh, I want to be fucking WWE champion or I want to be AEW champion or something like that. But honestly, like my only goal, uh, like in, ideally like sure everybody would want to be the world champion right it's it's a great thing you're at the top of the card but really i mean my my big goal has always been just to be able to make a living off of wrestling make a living off of wrestling for as long as possible uh so i mean really that that's that's my thing is as far as like is there anything i won't do like i mean shit man i'll be honest with you uh my my second booking my second independent booking i did was for uh a group of these juggalo fans that run some shows outside this little shitty bar in Wisconsin. And I worked a fucking casket match <laughs> uh, against a guy that's uh, from the area who's like, he's, he's okay, but he's not good. You know what I mean? So uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of up to do anything uh, within reason, as long as I don't feel like a complete fucking fool doing it. Right. 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 Yeah. Well, I just, you know, cause I'm sorry, Dennis, just, not, I wanted to just kind of elaborate because I just feel like now that the kind of the, the, the leash is off, you know, you're not contractually ob obligated to anybody and you can have a lot more creative fun. And yeah, you're probably going to have, you know, not the best talent, but you're also going to get so much different experience. You know what I mean? That was kind of my, my thought going into yeah. that prior question. Do you hey, mind that? I, to I totally get what you're saying. And I'm all like, I feel like life's all about accumulating good stories, you know, good stories and experiences. And so uh, I'm, I'm all about doing some, some, some different weird things. Uh, I mean, this isn't so crazy, but like last weekend I worked a show in Detroit and ceilings were like, I don't know, five feet above the, uh, the top ropes or, you know, there wasn't a whole lot you could do. I mean, I ended up wrestling Zach Gow and we did uh, a silly little uh, like kind of hardcore type match. I ended up like taping him to a dolly and running him into a pole. So you know, just, I, I, I enjoy, I enjoy the, the stupid shit in wrestling as much as I enjoy having like really good, like, wrestling wrestling type matches as well right yeah but i mean i, I will say though like it, it does feel good to like uh <laughs> weirdly it feels good to be making way less money and being able to do what i enjoy doing you know and being able to have that that creative freedom and, th and that's not saying that there wasn't a whole lot of creative freedom with ring of honor because after being there for so long uh i felt like there was a lot of trust put in me and um i was allowed to do uh you know do things the way I, I, I thought they should be done opposed to like, Oh, we want it done this way. And this is the way it has to be done, which is, you know, how it is at some companies. So it, it is nice, but I, I really do enjoy being able to like, uh, you know, pick and choose the shows that I want to do uh, pick and choose who I get to work with. It's, it's a, it's a, a great feeling, you know, to have that uh, know, power sounds so shitty and controlling, but to, to have that power a little bit to, to be able to do what you want to do. You know, to piggyback off your answer, I guess I'm going to have to ask you is how much wrestling did you consume when you were with Ring of Honor as a fan? And now that you're a free agent, do you feel like you have to do homework to catch up on who the Indy Darlings are now or what this guy's doing when you go in and get booked with a match with somebody? I've watched more wrestling in the last week than I probably watched in the last five years when I was with Ring of Honor. Uh, I mean, I'd watch the... Uh, the shows that we were on uh, while we were doing it, sit at the monitor and watch the matches. But after being there for so long, I, I mean, knew I knew what everybody did. I knew what everybody's uh, moveset set was, what their characters were. So I wasn't really watching as much wrestling, but yeah, now, now I'm definitely watching more wrestling, especially when I get booked some of these places and I find out who I'm working with. And I think I've never heard of that guy. I need to go on to YouTube or something and find out what this guy's all about. <coughs> well, is there anybody, you know, since this whole quote unquote, somewhat of a folding for ROH, even though they're coming back in April, yeah. Um, is there anybody that you've been surprised by getting into the ring with and you're kind of, you know, maybe it's, it's sparked something new for you? Because I know like sometimes as a musician, you go play with some newer bands, a band will just have to come and play and you're like, fuck. And it's like, it's, it's almost like a, a re, re, uh, you almost recommit yourself to the whole thing. You know what I mean? It, has there been an experience like that since, you know, 
Ring of Honor is is sort of uh, t- started its hiatus. Yeah, definitely. You know what, though? It hasn't been with uh, any person specific. I mean, I guess if it's been with any person specific, it's been with myself. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, like I said, those couple years off, uh, it made me fucking lazy, man. I was lazy. I just sat at home most of the time during the pandemic. Uh, like gyms were closed. Everything was closed. I just sat at home and drank a lot and got lazy and got fat a little bit. Uh, and then maybe like about a month before uh, we, we heard that it was closing, uh, you know, I, I had been back in the gym for a while, but about a month before that, I had really recommitted myself and really started um, stepping up uh, all the training that I needed to do for it. So then getting back and having, uh, you know, these handful of matches that I've had so far since then, uh, it's, it's, it's really sparked my, my drive to, to get better and be better. Because I remember, I remember years back before I started with Ring of Honor, like I would do crazy ass cardio workouts and I would, you know, I'd never get blown up or winded in the ring. And I kind of noticed towards the end uh, with Ring of Honor that, you know, that was happening where I was starting to get winded a little bit. And I didn't like it. I wasn't happy with how I was looking. So, uh, you know, this whole, this whole thing happening has been a weird good thing for me that it's, it's really motivated me to get back in and work hard. And I've just been happy with, I've been happy with my performances. I feel like they've been so much better and I'm better. And I feel like the, the, the more I keep going that way, it's only going to get better and better. So I guess I'm kind of, uh, I'm, I'm impressed that I'm, uh, able to step it up and still be able to go out there and wrestle guys that are 20 years younger than me and, uh, have them in the ring, suck and win saying, give me a second. <laughs> Now, what's the difference? Because there's, there's once again, going back to the whole nine-year block where you were signed with Ring of Honor, you did the indies before, you've done, you're doing the indies now, two different places in your career, two different times in wrestling as well. For you, what have you noticed the big differences from the indie scene, you know, 10, 12 years ago to now are for you? Uh, I feel like people are, are a little bit cooler now, to be honest with you. I feel like uh, when I started and even going, going forward after that, uh, you know, there was a lot of guys from the uh, kind of the older generation that uh, were around and all they did was just shit on the younger guys and say, Oh, they're doing too much. And just, you know, talk shit constantly. I feel like there's a, um, a, a better camaraderie, I guess, just in general amongst uh, locker rooms and that people are just kind of, treating each other better. But at the same time, I feel like a lot of guys all wrestle the same style nowadays. A lot of stuff is just go, 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 go. Uh, there's, there's not as much of the, the slow parts that are needed in matches. Uh, so, you know, I'm like kind of, kind of looking forward to be able to work with these younger guys and teach them to slow down a little bit. Well, I get, uh, did you want to piggyback Dennis? I'm sorry. No, no, no. Uh, oh, okay. I got another question. I'll wait. Okay, so my question is this, Wisconsin. Wisconsin is known for one thing in my household, and that's the Danish Kringle. Have you ever been to the Racine Danish Kringle spot, the bakery? And if so, what's your favorite Kringle? Uh, I've never been there, but they sell them at all the grocery stores here. And I buy one like almost every time I go grocery shopping. And which Uh, one do you normally gravitate towards? The raspberry. Fuck my man right there. I love my man right there. Question over. <laughs> yeah, raspberry, the raspberry is excellent, man. The raspberry is the next level. See, Hell so yeah. I mean, when I was a kid, you know, because my mom is Danish, you know, we always had a Kringle around Christmas time. I just had one for Christmas. And I mm-hmm. thought, as I'm eating the raspberry one, I'm like, this is the best Kringle. You don't need another Kringle. This is the yeah. only Kringle that needs to be. And then here we are. So sorry, I carry on. Yeah, great minds think alike. That's right. <laughs> well, I, I'm going to steal this question from PD Williams, who used to be on the podcast. Now he's WWE royalty, apparently. Um, I know. Forget right? about us. Excuse me, Pete Williams. Pete, Pete Williams. Pete. <laughs> <laughs> he always loves to ask this question, and you're a two time television champion in Ring of Honor. Do you remember, you know, when they told you you were going to get the championship, how you reacted, what were, you know, at least your first one, what, what your thoughts were when you were going through the match? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Like, you know, uh, wrestling on the independent scene, you win titles and stuff and it's cool. It's cool. And it's in itself that, you know, a company believes in you and whatever. But uh, when I won the television title the first time, it felt like uh 
I felt like everything I was doing was I was going right. That uh, I was I, I, I was making the right decisions in the sense that uh, you know when when you work for a company that's like on TV or a big worldwide recognized company and you win a title, it feels so much more important than when you say win a title for a you know like an independent company. Uh, I, I do. I remember it, and I mean that. That's basically how I felt. I just felt like I felt proud. I felt happy that uh, the company believed in me, and that they were, you know, they were willing to put the title on me. Uh, and then it was, uh, you know, I think the fun thing about that is the second time I won it, I got to. It was with uh, Kenny King. It was, um, I think it was like WrestleMania weekend down in New Orleans. It was at uh, one one of these buildings. I think it held like five, six thousand people. It was a sellout or damn close to it. Uh, so it was pretty cool being able to do that with uh, with a friend like Kenny. You know, Kenny is probably the one guy uh, in Ring of Honor that me and him hung out all the time. So he was like, to be able to have that that moment happen again and then have it happen with a really good friend like that was a pretty fucking cool experience. Well, I guess my next question is is about character development <clears throat> and you know seeing your character sort of evolve over you know a decade basically. Like, where you do you draw inspiration from mostly? Do you do you find it like do you read books, movies, whatever it is? Uh, I you know I, I take a lot of stuff from uh, from TV and movies for sure, and, and some stuff from reading. I don't read as much as I probably should, but uh, the big inspiration behind the whole uh, last real man thing was actually my father. Uh, you know, for a lot of years, I wrestled just as Silas Young was a guy who had long hair and a beard, was a good wrestler. Uh, then I had the opportunity with Ring of Honor to do the top prospect tournament. And uh, I had been kind of toying with the idea of the last real man thing. Uh, and it kind of came from the idea that like around the time, I want to say it was like maybe 2011, 2012, something like that. Uh, you know, terms like metrosexual uh, were becoming a thing. And like you started hearing about guys getting like manicures and pedicures and stuff like that. And uh, I had just started thinking like about uh, how I needed to do this character and uh, started thinking about how like men nowadays aren't like men like our fathers or our grandfathers were. And, and growing up, I was the youngest of six boys. And uh, my dad was like a real hard ass dude. And he had like the slick back hair and the mustache. My dad was like, uh, he, he was a pretty hard ass. Like all the kids in the neighborhood were scared of him. Like apparently when, when my older brothers were younger, like my dad beat up one of their buddies when he was drunk or something <laughs> like that. And he's talking shit to my mom, I guess. I don't know. Uh, well, so that's, that, that's that, due. That, that would have been, that would have been a receipt that was due. Go ahead. Sorry. Exactly. So it was like, uh, it was this idea. And then um, that I've been kind of toying with and then going into ring of honor, I thought, you know, there's all these guys here that are all really good. Everybody here is a really good wrestler. You don't get to like a major company without being really good at what you do. So I thought I have to do something to kind of make myself stand out and be different. And I knew that a lot of guys, especially around that time, there wasn't a whole lot of characters. It was just guys with a first name and a last name and they were really good wrestlers. So the that was kind of the idea on pulling the trigger. But I'd really say the big inspiration for that uh, came from my dad. Was, was he around to see you wrestle, to see you get to this point? Yeah, absolutely. My parents are uh, still both alive. And the funny thing is I remember uh, – when I first started, my dad's like, right, what do you want to do that fake wrestling shit for? <laughs> you know, and then uh, nowadays, uh, you know, my parents are both proud. My one brother, uh, he has like a painting company with my dad. And uh, he tell he tells me how my dad's always telling all the people that he works for that his son's a wrestler. And so I think they're, they're pretty proud. Yeah. Uh, did you have another question, Dennis? That's, that's sorry. you now. Okay. So, I mean, you know, it's funny that because this last real man thing is something that like I've always identified with because it's almost, it's because the way, the way that the culture shifted, but then again, you also mentioned how nicer it was in these locker rooms now on the Indies. And it's like, right. so seeing, seeing the culture kind of change with wrestling and, you know, obviously being at a company, sometimes that doesn't always happen, you know, when you've been someplace for so long, right. You, you kind of have a certain way you look at things. So what was like, the, besides the niceties and everything, you know, getting back out into, let's just call it for lack of a better term, uh, uh, the real world, you know, another job. What was like the biggest surprise for you? Um, I, don't, I don't know that there really has been one, to be honest with you. I've only done like, I mean, I've done shows, I guess, every weekend, but at this point it's only been like maybe what, like, five, six, seven, eight shows or something like that. Uh, 
I, I don't know that there really has been. I guess what what surprises me a little bit is there's a little bit of entitlement nowadays in wrestling. I feel like um, guys f- feel like they deserve so much so early and wrestling is definitely not a business that's always going to give you what you deserve, you know? So I, I feel like there's, there's definitely some entitlement. Wrestling's a weird thing that you have to be like super passionate about and, and really love and enjoy to, to really have longevity in it. I feel like, and I, uh, I think like maybe with some of these younger guys uh, that people might've been blowing smoke up their asses a little too quick in their careers and that they might make them burn out a little bit early. Mm-hmm. And and speaking of that, then who gave you your start? Who taught you how to wrestle? What school? How did you find your way into it? Because once again, you don't seem like one of those guys that has that entitlement. You, every time I watched, and this is as a fan looking in, I view a guy that's always thought, you know what? I'm valued in the company, but every match could be my last. I'm going to go out. I'm going to entertain and whatever happens happens. So I never got any of that especially in interviews I've seen you do, you you've never exuded that cockiness. Like I deserve to be here. So how, who kept you grounded? Who taught you? Let's dive a little bit into your background. Um, okay. So first, like I started, when I started out to train to wrestle, I got trained by this guy named Chris Bassett, who man, that dude is so fucking weird. Like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> did, uh, did this Cobra gimmick, which is like a very 1980s type gimmick, like a mask, and he calls himself the Cobra. So I remember like one of like one of the early days of training there, we would go like on Sundays and train in the yard that or train in the ring that was in their backyard. And he had like a little like foam head thing in the living room with the mask on it. And um, he had a son that was also he had been trained, but you know, came to training every week. And the kid was about my age, so I was probably about 20 at the time. And the kid had uh, pulled the mask off the head and put it on. And the mom freaked out at him, started yelling at him about, you don't disrespect the Cobra mask like that. And I remember even at 20 years old thinking like, wow, this is fucking bizarre, man. Like these people are like, I mean, I being serious about what you do and everything, but like, this is a little fucking overboard, you know? <laughs> uh, so I trained with him for about a year. And uh, it, during which time, you know, you meet people, you go to shows and uh, shortly thereafter, like finishing my training, I'd had a handful of matches and I ended up working with a guy who didn't properly catch me on like a dive type thing. And I ended up dislocating my elbow. Uh, so during the time of recovery, I kind of remember sitting at home and thinking like, man, I like I need to go somewhere else and kind of finish my training. I feel like these people, they've shown me the the basics of like locking up and grabbing holds and running a couple little spots. But I, like, I never learned how to properly like put a match together. And by that point I kind of realized that this wasn't the place I was going to teach me how to properly put a match together. So by that time I had met a guy who lived up in the green Bay area, which is about 20 minutes from where I'd grown up. And I'd went up there and kind of finished my training with him. His name's uh, Mike Mercury. He had trained a uh, uh, like Ken Anderson and uh, a handful of other guys from the area and had always ran good shows. So I'd finished my training with him and then uh, kind of continued on from there, just getting booked everywhere I could and stuff like that. And then as far as like what keeps me grounded, you know, I've never been a politicker. I like, I've never been one to be like, Oh, you guys should do this and put this title on me. So you know, kind of going back to that question you asked before about the whole TV title thing, how it felt like, I, I think part of what felt really good was that I got that title because the company believed on me, not because I sat there and like message people and, and tried bullshitting my way into getting something uh, that I felt like I deserved opposed to what the company felt like they uh, was deserving. Uh, so I feel like, um, I don't know. I just, I've just never been like that. I've never been like one to, really say like you should do this you should do that i always felt like uh the company should uh, recognize your talent and they should do things with you because they see it not because you see it because to be honest this is entertainment and we all think we're the fucking greatest thing in the world you know so uh i think uh maybe it's just part of my upbringing i don't know maybe it's a little bit of uh entertainment and being insecure that we're you know it's always going to be your last show and you should just be cool and, you know, do what's asked of you, I guess, maybe a little bit of all that combined. I know what it's like. I have to put Lars over every week in our match. (laughs) One time I would like to go over on him, but he books it and he says, I got to do the job every week. Right. (laughs) 
I mean, you know, are you going to stick with the champion or are you going to, but right. anyways, you, you can't make a job or anything else, but a jobber. <laughs> you know, you're, I mean, Dennis, I mean, I will say this. You're an incredible enhancement guy. Okay. Thank you. All right. You're so, a great hand. Yeah. You're a great hand. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, so I, I started thinking about this when, when you were talking and, and I was, and I was kind of wondering myself, you know, because now you're, you've been in this business basically 20 to uh, a couple decades, right? You've seen it yep. change. You've been at places, you've been to the, to the WWE, you've worked there, you, you, you've worked ring of honor, you've worked in, in a few other places. <clears throat> is there, is there a certain, is, I mean, now that you're kind of watching more wrestling and like you said, cause you're, you know, maybe going on YouTube, checking out these guys, you're doing casket matches for juggalos. You know, you're really broadening your horizons. Unfortunately. Um, <laughs> but is there is there is there somebody out there right now where you're kind of like, I'd love to get into the ring with him or her or whoever it is? Because like I said, it's it's a whole different fucking world. You know, you're you're seeing so many different kinds of matches, and it's 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 it's, it's the world's your oyster in, as in a sense for in the wrestling world, you know, that was it's just never been like this, but is there somebody out there male or female that you'd like to get in there with? Uh, you know what? There's, I can't say there's like anyone specific, but uh, you know, there is so much good talent out there. Uh, I, I just want to be able to like get in there and work with the guys that are re really respected as being some of the best wrestlers and, you know, not just prove to the fans, but prove to myself that I can, that I can hang with that, that I can still go, uh, with the best guys that are out there, which in turn proves to everybody that I'm fucking great at what I do too. So I can't say that there's there's one specific person or even a handful of guys because there's so many times that I'll watch stuff and I'll be like, man, that guy's really fucking good. I'd love to be able to work with him. And I feel like uh, the one thing that's definitely changed in wrestling, uh, training has gotten better. Uh, guys that are guys and girls that are coming out that are younger, their training is getting better in the sense that there's more like a a certain curriculum, so to speak, of how they're teaching guys to wrestle. So I'm, I'm excited to just see how uh, how it is to work with some of these younger people. Now that that makes a ton of sense, especially knowing PD and watching how he does things and listen to you, Doc. That wow. Now I know we're wrapping this podcast up here in a minute, and I guess I'm going to have to ask you this. Uh, being the first podcast we've done in 2022, thank you, by the way, do you set goals now? Are your goals, now that you're kind of a free agent, what are your indie goals? Have you even thought about stuff like that? Or is it, I'm just going to go out and see what happens. Uh, I mean, there's definitely goals. I mean, I, I would, I, the one goal I said was, uh, I'm not going to let myself get uh, so caught up in trying to find a job somewhere right away. Uh, you know, I was, decently smart and managed to save some money and uh the the independent bookings are going pretty good i just really want i guess my goal is to go out in 2022 and just have a solid year of being booked consistently trying to uh, pick up the best bookings possible working at places that'll get me you know a little pub or some notoriety and just get myself back in like the best shape i can possibly get myself in and i know that uh that the better shape i'm in the better performances i'll put on the better i'll be um yeah, I really feel like uh, this sounds a little cheesy, but I feel like we're all like put here to like do something right. Like we're all given this skill or um, this drive to do something. And I really feel like my skill that I was given was to be a pro wrestler. So mm -hmm. I don't try and put too much stress on it. Like thinking like, Oh my God, I gotta like by April, I have to like get a job somewhere or I need to like get this booking or that booking. I'm just trying to get out there and like control the things that I can control be like the, the you know the best version of myself possible uh and i think that if i do that then good things will come because of that april huh i hear ring of honors running a show in april <laughs> <laughs> who knows i might not even be fucking booked on it <laughs> well I, all i can say is like you know you can go the playboy buddy rose route bro i mean you might as well just fucking chain smoke and kringles i mean you could have a whole different gimmick and we haven't seen a play you know playboys you know uh, anyways so we're this is this show was always it was started because we're all wrestling fans you know what i mean and we've had some wrestlers on here that said that they were wrestling fans which That's fucking weird. blew my goddamn mind so i don't know which category you fall in but uh 
I want to know, were you a wrestling fan growing up? Oh yeah, absolutely, man. Like one of my youngest memories is uh, one of my older brothers body slamming me on the floor in the living room when I was like probably six or seven years old. Uh, you know, all my brothers were big wrestling fans. So I grew up with it uh, on TV. And uh, I mean, I basically watched it my whole life. I think I had like about two years, like maybe in middle school or early high school where I didn't watch it. But uh, basically for my whole life, I've been a fan. I think it's wild that there's people that get into wrestling that aren't wrestling fans, to be honest with you. I mean, I guess I kind of understand like some of these guys that have like worked for WWE who got signed because they were like a football player or, or a track star or whatever. I mean, I kind of understand it, but for them, it, it feels like a lot of those guys just fizzle out fast. You know, they, they do their little run with WWE and then it's just, it's, it's gone. And, you know, it goes back to that thing about you have to really love this shit to do it because especially getting started out on the independent scene, you ain't making dick doing this, you know, and uh, you're definitely damaging your body. So, I mean, definitely been a big fan my whole life. Well, my final question for the podcast is, and we've talked about your family a little bit, but is there one match where you kind of had all your family there to watch you that like that special, whatever match it is, or, or most of your family there that you really felt like this was your match? Uh, no, you know, I've never had that, but, uh, you know, when I was younger and, and doing, uh, independence around the area, I grew up, uh, you know, all my family had come, like most of my brothers had been and my, my parents had been to shows. So I've definitely had that experience, but not, never like anything where it was like, yeah, my family needs to come see this. Well, I guess my final question has to do with, you know, not only being like, um, what, uh, you know, it's going to go, go back a little bit to the fan question and it's kind of a generic question but I need to know this. So was there one wrestler in your life? Because I have an idea when I watch you who I think that you're drawing inspiration for or, or whatever, but who's the one guy that maybe like you were like, that's why I want to be a wrestler. Uh, you know what? I don't, I don't know if there is any one guy. I feel like I drew a lot from a, a lot of different guys, uh, but, but definitely like growing up, uh, and then even being young in wrestling, uh, I watched a lot of like old Ric Flair, Rick, Ricky Steamboat matches, um, a lot of stuff with the Rockers, Shawn Michaels. Um, but, but I don't think I ever had one guy that I was very specific. Like, this is, this is my guy, you know, well, who, who, who did you think it was? Well, I'm, you didn't mention either of them, so I'm not going to say shit. Oh, 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 come on. Come you're, on now you're going to have to come back. Oh, come, on, come, back. come on, <laughs> See, Lark. All right. So, uh, so, <laughs> Lark. Lark. Come on, Lark. Lark. Um, Lark. So, I, you always kind of remind, uh, reminded me of a Dr. Death. Oh, shit. Yeah. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. I mean, just, just your persona. Yeah, I don't know what it is, but I, I kind of, I, I just always kind of felt that from you. But, you know. Definitely, you definitely a fan of his work. Definitely well, a fan. Because the funny thing is, you mentioned the more of the flamboyant. And even though, well, Steve Williams was somewhat flamboyant in his own way. He was a fucking brick shit house, a man's man. You know, right, you know that right. you're you're getting in there with 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 somebody, and and just with the whole thing, you know, the, since the whole interview, I was like, this guy's fucking like Steve Williams. You know, what I mean, just <laughs> your voice, everything. So, anyways, I but that's what I've seen in you. But I, you know, whatever. I appreciate that. I'm gonna have to go back and watch uh, watch some more of his work now. I think you should because yeah. uh, you know I I feel like. Your body, your look, it's, I mean, you're not like a, a barrel wheel, you know, a fucking, you know what I'm saying, whatever. But. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe after a few more fucking Kringles, we'll get that Dr. Death body, but. Yeah, you know, right. But no, but just, you're a brick shit house. That's all. <laughs> Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Way to, way to talk your way out of that. <laughs> what are you trying to go down the road? I was a little worried. And then you came back and I thought, that's a good talker right there. <laughs> well that's why i can cut the promo that's why you got to put me over all the fucking time because all right that's right you know, man. learn how to cut a promo bro he gets an entrance i come out there in the commercial break <laughs> <laughs> you don't even that? get the little sca- you don't even get the little square at the top of the screen showing you <laughs> no, i have one colored shorts and that's it i have no elbow pads i'm just a no tape on my armrest i'm just as plain and he comes out all flamboyant to bad street usa and over <laughs> So where can people find you, especially if they want to book you in a casket match somewhere in Wisconsin? <laughs> uh, you know, you can find me uh, on Twitter at last real man, ROH, which, you know, feeling like I probably need to change that name now, uh, as well as same name on Instagram. Uh, you know, probably if you're interested. 
interested in any merchandise. There's always pro wrestling tees. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm kind of online anywhere, uh, anywhere, anywhere else, anybody, anywhere, anybody else would be. All right. Listen, uh, thank you so much for carving a few minutes out of your day to talk to two wrestling nerds that are geeking out over this interview. We had so much fun. All right. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. I had fun too, guys. Thank you so much, bro.